Mrs. William Force Scott of Yonkers, New York, was no supporter of women's suffrage. Like many other so-called antis, Mrs. Scott's objections to the movement were not limited to her opinion that the law of the land should remain unchanged. Scott, a member of the New York State Association opposed to women's suffrage, wrote a letter to the Times in 1912 in which she condemned suffragist leader Harriet Stanton Blatch for being an advertiser. Blatch had made the suggestion that, quote, it is not logic and reason that convince, but an appeal to emotion, and she urged that suffragists would do well to, in her words, study the methods of the press agent. The mere words, votes for women, repeated over and over again, would at least carry the idea of the political freedom of women into many obtuse minds. Calling the pro-suffrage group noisy, Mrs. Scott wrote that the proposal to double the electorate by adding a new element, frankly led by emotionalism, may surely be considered a menace so grave as to give men not only food for thought, but cause for at least the emotion of indignation. Mrs. Scott's reasoning was faulty, but she was right about at least one thing. The suffrage campaign of the early 20th century was noisy. Used in combination, sound, advertising, and the appeal to emotion were among the most important weapons in the battle for the vote. Of course, this was also the case for Scott's own camp. Over the nearly 70-year-long campaign for women's enfranchisement in the United States, the Antis asserted repeatedly that if women continued to fight for, let alone win, the vote, traditional gender roles would be overturned, and even one's own mother would be unrecognizable as she turned into, to use the words of historian Margaret Finnegan, an unsexed, unattractive, and selfish danger to family, home, and nation. Still more terrifying was the prospect that father would be left with the housekeeping and child care duties. Suffragists found themselves in a double bind. They needed to keep their cause before the public, but they also faced the perception, even within their own ranks, that it was inappropriate for women to visibly, and audibly, occupy public spaces with political activity. The suffrage movement was fundamentally tied to American consumer culture. Many companies thought of appealing to suffragists as just another way to hook female customers. Some shamelessly drew upon the themes and images of the movement to sell unrelated products. And the comparison of shopping, already considered a woman's responsibility, to voting, was a theme that underpinned the argument in favor of suffrage. The campaign itself was fully merchandised, and, as Margaret Finnegan argues in her 1999 book, Selling Suffrage, 20th century suffragists made their biggest forward strides once their message became a product that could be effectively marketed. A New York Times article from 1914 entitled Trinkets and Songs of the Suffragists ticks off a sampling from the abundance of commodities available by mail and in suffrage shops. Soap, candy, postcards, stationery, playing cards, buttons, sashes, banners, and, of course, songs. Both supporters and detractors made their cases to the greater public within the commercial sphere. But, as Finnegan cautions, the meanings of these artifacts are, quote, not easily deciphered. A suffrage badge or hat might have meant one thing to the woman wearing it and quite another to her family. Musical emblems were similarly used and interpreted at cross-purposes. Danny O'Crew's extensive catalog of suffrage-related sheet music documents American songs about women's rights dating back to the late 18th century. Songs dealing specifically with enfranchisement began to appear regularly after the Civil War, as activists turned their attention from abolition to women's suffrage. Rally songs, and those intended for political fundraising, were often self-published affairs, whereas major publishing firms were the usual source of comic songs caricaturing suffragists as foolish or unfeminine. Musical commodities, like other suffrage objects, served a dual function. Their sale raised money for organizations, and, when performed, they turned singers' bodies into living advertisements for or against the cause. 
While some suffragists were able to make their livelihood as professional politicians and lobbyists, most were unable to devote themselves fully to the cause without independent wealth. No less a pioneer than Sojourner Truth sold song sheets to support herself and her activism. Partisans on both sides frequently penned new words for well-known tunes and distributed them via booklets, broadsides, or the mainstream press. Newspapers and magazines printed both pro- and anti-suffrage lyrics and sponsored songwriting contests. By 1914, so many women were writing lyrics that the director of the National Women's Suffrage Publishing Company kindly urged prospective contributors to focus on producing fact-based literature. Tunes like John Brown's Body, which had already been made into the Battle Hymn of the Republic by suffragist Julia Ward Howe, were already common fodder for political contrafacta when they were turned into melodic battlegrounds over suffrage. Tin Pan Alley's penchant for songs about parenthood and soldiering also proved useful, as pro-suffragists emphasized the fact that they were normal wives and mothers, and antis attempted to paint mothering and political activity as mutually exclusive. References to sentimental parlor songs, Civil War songs, or Tin Pan Alley tearjerkers, such as Home Sweet Home, Tramp, 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 Everybody Works But Father, and I Didn't Raise My Boy to Be a Soldier, were common. Activists knew that selling not only their songs, but also their message, required having them plugged in the most prominent fashion possible. In 1900, for example, an 81-year-old John W. Hutchinson, of Hutchinson family fame, performed at a suffrage bazaar that featured not only plenty of merchandise, but a noteworthy appearance by another octogenarian, Susan B. Anthony. There was hardly a female singer who was not asked her opinion on the issue, and Billboard, a rather unabashed pro-suffrage publication, urged the participation of entertainment professionals. Opera singer Lillian Nordica was an outspoken suffragist who sang in demonstrations and suffrage concerts. Her colleague, Louisa Tetrazzini, perhaps fortunately not an American citizen, endorsed the opposite position, claiming that women would only elect men who were good-looking. Suffrage concerts and other musical entertainments grew out of a well-established tradition of featuring music at meetings of women's clubs and societies. Musical performances supported speeches by political figures, enticing an audience with music, and holding them captive for politics. A stateside appearance of the famed British suffragette Sylvia Pankhurst, for example, was sponsored by a women's political equity club. Her speech was framed with performances by an all-male vocal ensemble. There were also many rivaling anti-suffrage concerts as the other side kept pace. The 19 teens saw a wide variety of suffrage-related entertainments, many musical in nature, from plays and vaudeville turns to musicals, pageants, and even an operetta. On some occasions, outdoor demonstrations were disguised as concerts to avoid local ordinances or the difficulties of obtaining permits for locations like Central Park. Through these performances, Female musicians, conductors, and composers were seen and heard by larger audiences than many, if not most of them, would have otherwise reached. Flora Wilson, daughter of the Secretary of Agriculture and a trained operatic soprano, was, quote, intent on demonstrating the powerful influence women have on music in the United States. As musical director for a number of demonstrations, she engaged both professional and amateur women musicians for large-scale events in Washington, D.C. Other female directors showed similar determination. A demonstration in New York in 1911 featured suffragists singing the Women's Political March, written and conducted by Elsa Gregory. Proceedings in D.C. on May 9, 1914, featured Mrs. Appeline M. Blair, president of the Washington Rubenstein Club, leading a 1,000-voice chorus in March of the Women by British suffragist and composer Ethel Smythe. The bigger, more spectacular, and well-advertised these performances grew, the more the suffragists began to distinguish themselves from their opponents, who, it seems, had finally argued themselves into a corner. Harriet Stanton Blatch, 
Alice Paul, and other American suffragists who had spent time in England saw the beginnings of the militant suffrage movement there. They believed the publicity their English sisters garnered was exactly what the American movement needed to gain momentum. This idea was controversial. One of the first large-scale outdoor demonstrations in the U.S., organized by Blatch in New York City in 1910, was boycotted by a number of her compatriots, who all told Blatch that they were ill. Suffragists negotiated how to gain publicity without notoriety, or what Billboard called the aid of the unseemly, unladylike, vixenish, caddish militantism of England. While they never fully achieved this balance, internal resistance did weaken, as these excerpts from a first-hand account of a 1915 parade in New York City reveal. Three o'clock on the afternoon of October 23rd, and a glorious day. Every band in greater New York and some beyond blows like the breeze today. First, it's Tipperary. Then Tipperary again, and once more Tipperary. At last we move. We begin to swing along together in something like rhythm. My heart is thumping louder than the band. By the time we had gone two blocks, I had forgotten everything I had expected to feel. All my girlhood, Mother had repeated that a lady should never allow herself to be conspicuous. To march up Fifth Avenue had promised to flout directly one's early training. I was mistaken. There's no notoriety about it. When it's done along with 25,000 other women, nothing could seem more natural. Marches thereafter became common in all but the most conservative parts of the country, becoming virtually synonymous with the word suffrage. When a delegation of suffragists wanted to enter the Capitol building in 1913 to present a petition to Congress, they gained approval only when they promised to leave their bands of music outside. The majority of marching bands and suffrage parades were all male. Some of the larger parades used as many as 40 ensembles, which were interspersed between groups of marchers. Little is said in the press or in suffrage organization records about how these bands came to be engaged, so we're left to wonder if the men viewed the performances as personal activism or just another gig. There were also some mixed-sex and all-women bands. The relative scarcity of such ensembles wasn't for a lack of trying on the part of organizers. One group moved its suffrage picnic indoors because, quote, we haven't a women's band yet, and we certainly don't want any men to lead our procession. The women's band of the Salvation Army was invited to lead a 1913 parade in Brooklyn. The same year, another all-female band, led by music teacher Alma Nash of Maryville, Missouri, was brought to the head of the parade in Washington, D.C. to help pacify large and unruly crowds. Women's brass bands may have been exceptions to the rule, but the figure of the herald, depicted as a bugler sounding the call for equality, became an icon of the movement in the 19-teens. The image of a woman in pseudo-medieval regalia with bugle in hand adorned many print materials, including sheet music. Inez Milholland, lauded as a suffrage martyr after her death of anemia and exhaustion in 1916, received much publicity for her enactments of the herald. Milholland was not a musician, but women brass players did lead demonstrations, and an opening bugle call became fashionable for grand events. Rose Bauer, a coronetist and cattle rancher from South Dakota, for example, was already appearing as a musician and a temperance lecturer on the Chautauqua circuit when she turned her attention to women's enfranchisement in 1915 and became a traveling suffrage bugler. With this history in mind, Let's turn to a few brief examples that illustrate common ways in which the suffrage debate was depicted in popular song. Most songs from this era begin by placing us within a world threatened by the musical suffragist, be it the lifestyle of a white, middle-class male now endangered by his wife's activism, or an imagined society where voting women have subverted traditional gender roles. This threat is frequently established through minor keys, chromaticism, and other musical clichés of foreboding, sometimes so over-the-top as to suggest that the paranoid antis were also being mocked. This type of framing can be heard in Charles Denton's recording of The Lands Where the Women Wear the Trousers, which, 
like many popular songs with this theme, was heard both in Britain and America. The song is introduced by a descending chromatic line. <laughs> I've been reading in the papers of a very funny land. It's the land where the women wear the trousers, where woman is the boss and poor old man is second hand. In the land where the women wear the trousers. And it is closed by a quotation of Home Sweet Home that reassures us that any land with trouser-wearing women is purely imaginary and that we have never really left home. Poor old suffragette. I've got a suffragette. <laughs> My wife's a suffragette. I've heard her door and I'm suffering yet. <laughs> In the land where the women wear the trousers. Sometimes the threat of suffrage was further contained by placing it outside the world of the white bourgeoisie altogether, and songs about African Americans and foreigners frequently deal with a fear confronted less frankly elsewhere, that politically active women might hold the power to emasculate by withholding sex or taking over the dominant role. Musical symbols were harder to take from the hands of suffragists than banners or sashes. The vast majority of Tin Pan Alley songs on the subject, however, view the musical suffragist from a male perspective, and pro-suffrage music could be reinterpreted in such a way as to make it seem trivial. That ragtime suffragette, used in the Ziegfeld Follies of 1913, not only introduces the suffragist with a descending chromatic line, but it takes her bugle calls and marching band music and turns them into a rag, rendering the music somewhat less impressive. Johnny, Johnny, run and get your gun. Get it quick, or you'll be dead, my son. It will make Napoleon quake and shake his head with me. Your Mother's Gone Away to Join the Army, also from 1913, similarly uses context to disempower suffrage music. The song plays on old tearjerker tropes as it describes a child who longs for his absent mother, who has gone to fight for women's rights. <laughs> 
Like previous examples, this one begins with a somewhat ominous minor key verse before moving into a cheery chorus representing the suffragists. This section features both the Herald's bugle call and a quotation of the Civil War song, Tramp, Tramp, Tramp. The lyrics and musical context, however, let us know that mothering and soldiering are not compatible activities. by his father's knee could see that he was crying he was sad as he could be he sobbed and said i feel so blue as tears ran down his cheek oh father where is mother she has not been home for weeks his pa said lad the tale is sad she's down at suffrage hall she's gone to fight for women's rights why there's their bugle call The tramp of their feet as they come down the street. Gee, those girlies look sweet. They're all dressed up so neat. Your dear old ma just took a fighter's place. She likes the smell of powder cause it's always on her face. There's no rat in her hair. You can see she don't care. Hold her head in the air. Gee, your mother's a bear. Tramp, 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 the girls are marching. Your mother's gone away to join the army. Everything changed in 1917. The war years show almost no activity in terms of suffrage songs, as Tin Pen Alley turned to patriotic material, and all but the most radical suffragists redirected their efforts towards national service. After the war, the apparent mismatch between mothering and men's work had lost its power and the recontextualization of suffrage music, the basis of the humor from earlier in the century, was no longer effective. Even sexist comic songs seemed resigned to change, as the song, You'd Better Be Nice to Them Now, from 1918, illustrates. After the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, Harriet Stanton Blatch reflected on what had made her advertising campaign successful, noting that, quote, The enemy must hear music, as must each marcher too, music all the time. If the beat, beat of the feet, were to be kept in time and in tune with the beat of the heart. Greater than his mother, no man is half so good. No man is better than the wife he loves. Her love will guide him, whatever betide him. He's good enough to love you and adore you. Good enough to bear your troubles for you, and if your tears were falling today, nobody else would keep them away. She's good enough to warm your heart with kisses when you are lonesome and blue. She's good enough to be your baby's mother, and she's good enough to vote with. 